Harold Davis. I'm here to teach you about the art and craft of digital photography. Harold Davis is a best-selling author of many books, including his latest, Creative Garden Photography from Rocky Nook, which can now be pre-ordered. He is also the author of Creative Black and White Digital Photography Tips and Techniques, also from Rocky Nook. His black and white work has been collected worldwide, and the Seattle Book Review said that Harold Davis is the digital black and white equal of Ansel Adams' traditional wet photography. Adams would be awed by Davis's work. Harold is the developer of a unique technique for photographing flowers for transparency. He's the creator of multi-raw processing and hand HDR processing. He is a Moab master and a Zeiss ambassador. He is an internationally known photographer and a sought after workshop leader. His website is digitalfieldguide.com. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Harold Good morning. I must say, what an introduction. That's a fair amount to live up to. The presentation that I'm giving, I hope, works on a variety of levels. First of all, if what you want is to see some beautiful, distracting imagery, I hope that this will serve that purpose and wash over you and perhaps even take you away from the uh, obvious cares right now. Otherwise, um, th there will be a fair amount about technique, and uh, I hope to share interesting stories, interesting things about the images, and inspire you to your own creativity. So with that said, let me share my screen. So this is Creative Black and White, and uh, it's how how the monochromatic vision works in a digital world. Um, an interesting question, really, because after all, we see the world in color. What, what is it that makes black and white imagery special? So I'll try to address that in this presentation, among other things. Here's the cover of my current book, Creative Black and White Digital Photography Tips and Techniques. And um, I'll be showing the table of contents of the book toward the end of this presentation, so you can get some idea of how it overlaps with both the, um, the contents of this webinar and also with uh, the, the three more in the series that we're presenting of black and white work. The, of course, once you've seen this webinar, you probably don't need to actually buy the book, just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm also showing the covers of some of my previous books that have some relationship to black and white photography. There was the uh, the uh, black and white handbook was the previous one. And this is achieving your potential as a photographer a, with a workbook and tools for upping the, the creativity in your work. And I wrote a specialized book for Focal Press a while back called Monochromatic HDR Photography. People tend to think of HDR as an extension of the dynamic range of color photography ranging from creating impossible photographs to grotesque effects and think it's about color, but actually at what HDR, high dynamic range photography, is really about is extending the dynamic range of a photograph and that can be done whether the range is in color or in grayscale, as in black and white. So monochromatic HDR photography is an interesting topic and one where you don't have to worry about the colors getting too garish. My black and white books have been translated into a number of languages. Here's the Spanish uh, version of one of my books from a while back. There's a nice new French translation of the current one. So I like seeing my books. Yeah. In broad. What is the monochromatic vision and why should we care? Um, you see this Nautilus shell twice, right? Excuse me for a second, I need a sip of water. The back at the dawn of photography, 
there was no choice as to whether one would be in black and white, black and white and color because there was only black and white. There were various exotic ways to add color in, most of them amounting essentially to paint, painting color onto negatives or prints or positives of some kind, but it really wasn't possible to do a photographic version of a color scene in color. Uh, it became accepted after a while that photography was black and white. And when color began to be developed in the late 1950s, it was an exotic thing. Um, then it became a cliche too, as in Kodachrome slides of family pictures and things like that. The point of an image like this one of, the, of an old Russian workbench in Fort Ross, California, is for my viewpoint was to create an effect that is as much about an old style etching as it is about a photograph. You can see in the photograph that the light is dappled or chiaroscuro, light and dark on the image. With this image here of uh, Yucca, you can see also that there's a, an attempt on my part to create a lithographic effect. I'm almost as concerned with being artistic in my approach to black and white conversion as I am to creating something that will, people will look at and say, this is a photograph. The reasons for this are somewhat that, what is the black and white vision? Why should we care? We're creating something that is already a construct that's already something that's not what you see in nature. So why not go further and try to add all the possible artistic effects to it that you can? I call this image, the road less traveled. So pick a road, which one would you prefer? In my life, I've always traveled the road less traveled and that's what we need to do at this point as well. The thing with this, one of the things with this image is that toward the end of this presentation, I'll show you the color version that I created before I converted it to black and white. It's not bad, uh, but it doesn't have the staying power, the resonance that this image has in black and white. People look at a black and white image and they say, there's some reason to look, to look at it, some reason why I'm here, that it has something to do with the aesthetics of the image and the way it looks in, in as something that's a construct that's been created. By the way, let me stop for a second and define the difference between black and white and monochromatic. Obviously, a black and white image is something that it uses black and whites, is technically in grayscale. Monochromatic means it uses one color. So you could have a blue monochromatic image or a sepia monochromatic image. It's not necessarily just black and whites. What's really interesting about this in the context of digital photography is that with a certain amount of exceptions, with an asterisk, and all life has an asterisk, doesn't it? Uh, the files that one is printing from are color files anyhow. So what it, one is creating with a monochromatic image is a facsimile of black and white or a simulation. The images are not really black and white. With this um, image that I think of as a ribbon of light photographed looking up in one of the Antelope Canyons near Page, Arizona, I, when I first processed the image, I, I saw that I had a really wide dynamic range that was possible. Like most of my images, this comes from a range of seven to 10 exposures that are uh, captured at the same time. And when I reproduced it, I saw the details in the black areas, both at the foreground and then on the upper left and upper right. When I did that, the image itself wasn't uh, really very, attractive. So I put it back so that I had black top and bottom and then just the ribbon of light in the center. Point here really is that with digital black and white, you can control all aspects of your image if you take the care to do it with layers and masking so that one is in control, not the camera. This image here is of Bixby Bridge, the famous Bixby Bridge built in the 1930s under the WPA program. 
along the coast of Big Sur, California, taken at night, about a 30 second exposure. The Before this bridge was built, all of Big Sur was isolated and very hard to get to. Uh, maybe they feel that way now too. The image here is of reflections in a main pond, again, a seven to 10 exposures. And this, the, this was early autumn, so the colors were fairly special. And it's not bad as a color image also, but here black and white is used as a implier of color. So in other words, by showing this image in black and white, and making people who view the image think that, hey, there's color here, but what is it? Like every image that's a photograph, there always are at least two people in the image, even when it's of uh, trees and a lake in nature, because that's how an image is. So there's the viewer and the photographer, and it's a conversation with the viewer in which I get them to meditate on what the color of the uh, autumn foliage in Maine is. Uh, the Piazza San Marco in Venice, normally speaking, uh, in normal times, you can't capture it without people unless you go there at three in the morning like this photograph is. I stayed there for a few days a few years back and had the chance to wander the city at night. So black and white is great at night because it takes light sources that may not be the world's most attractive light and turns it into patterns. In some ways, one of the underlying characteristics of black and white is that it shows you the patterns of what's under there. With a color image, you can hide the fact that you have nothing to say under, under uh, colors that are garish perhaps and not the world's most interesting. Here we have Turtle Tower in the uh, Central Lake in downtown Hanoi in Vietnam. And uh, this is sort of an oasis of quiet in a very noisy, bustling city. The Turtle Tower is built in memory of a turtle king who rose to defend Vietnam from the great Chinese invaders many centuries ago. The patterns of light and dark in this bridge and reflection, the Pont Valentre near Cahors in southwestern France, show that what the, this kind of black and white image is really about is the difference between the, the patterns, the echoing arches and reflections and crenellations in this ancient structure make for interesting re repetition, mirroring and pattern. So that's part of what I look for in a black and white image. And you know, sometimes it's fun to just play as in this sepia tinted monochromatic image looking at the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. What I did here, if, and it's gonna be hard to see on your screens, but I, I painted a couple of fairly small splotches of color back into the black and white image. This used to be done as a, on purpose as a hand painting technique where you would take a romantic image of some kind perhaps and paint in features. And in this one, what I did was I put red into uh, traffic lights and car tails, trails, tails, and left the rest of the image alone. Phyllis, before I get into this next slide, are there any uh, questions that I should uh, address right now? Yes, there are a few questions. Uh, from Gary Litwin, do you let your camera automatically do the exposure brackets or do you set your seven to 10 exposures manually? Gary, that's a great uh, question. Personally, I like to set mine manually. There, this is sort of one of those uh, issues where there's no right and wrong answer. There are people who prefer to do it both ways. It also depends on your hardware. The auto bracket programs are different with different brands. The Nikon auto bracket programs will let you do nine up to nine exposures, and that's enough to do a good uh, bracket. I believe some of the Canons limit you to seven, which may or may not be quite enough. The, that said, I prefer to do it manually because I can see what I'm getting in between. And I might say, well, I really need to go more on the darker side and less on the lighter side or the other way around. Or I might say, hey, that's enough. I can move on to something else. The uh, at, at one EV apart, which is what I use, I've got plenty of exposure range between the raw files. So 
uh, it, you know, it's kind of it's kind of up to me. The downside to doing it the way I do it is that if you're not careful, you can move the camera slightly when you're shifting the exposure. So that's something to be careful about and to make sure the camera and tripod are firmly uh, are firmly mounted. Good question, Gary. Thank you. Uh, Susan would like to know: Do you have a supplier for such a perfect Nautilus shell? <laughs> uh, Nautiluses are no is the short answer. I don't. Uh, no, Nautiluses are increasingly an endangered species because people collect the shells. However, uh, which is sad and so sad about so many things with the environment and and what we've been doing there. Uh, there was a store in Berkeley. Uh, called the Bone Room, which had many great shell specimens, and that's where I got this one. Um, let's see, Greg would like to know if you will cover how one makes black and white images captured by iPhones, either in this session or the next. Um, that's not really part of the curriculum of this black and white course. However, I am giving an, an iPhone webinar, and I do plan to cover black and white in, the, uh, in, in that course in that webinar. And uh, Susan would like to know, please discuss the amount of manipulation you undertake in post shoot. For example, with the image of the French viaduct, how much did you manipulate the contrast between black and white? Susan is talking about this image, which is going to appear on the screen in a minute. We have a bit of a time lag today that I'm trying to work around. I think it may, may be because of the number of people we have on this webinar. It hasn't usually happened in the in the past in quite the same way. Um, well, Susan, I, I, um, I consider this a relatively unmanipulated image for me. Uh, you know. When I when I give an in person workshop, I I often I get I expect the question early on was this image photoshopped? So you know I kind of head that one off at the pass. I say all my images are photoshopped. The answer to that question is always going to be yes. <laughs> and you know here's the other truth, and that is that's true for most successful professional photographers. I'd almost say all successful. Uh, professional photographers, only many of them aren't as happy to admit it as I am. I'm happy to admit it. Um, even those who don't admit it, it's mostly true. So yeah, uh, there's manipulation here, but in some ways the kind of manipulation in this image is classic photo manipulation. In other words, I could have done this in the wet dark room without much trouble. Certainly I boosted the contrast. That's what this image is about. It's a high contrast image with dark darks and light lights. And without that, the pattern of the opening trapezoids within the each of the oval crenellations wouldn't be apparent wouldn't be apparent. But there's nothing that's unphotographic about the nature of this manipulation. I'll certainly show you some images later on where it uh, where the manipulation is less photographic, as you'll see. Uh, but, you know, one point is that, and I, I bring this up in a slide later on, that anything you can do in the camera is good. Get as good an image in the camera as you can. There's several reasons for this, but the most, the one that is most compelling to me is time. Um, I have a busy life. I've got, as Phyllis will tell you, four kids at home and, uh, work and all kinds of things to do. And I, I love processing my images, but it takes me some time. So if I can get it right in the camera, boy, am I ever going to do that? Um, I recommend it. You know, photography is a camera is a computer with a lens at one end and a, and a sensor or a scanner basically at the other end. The computer in the camera is not as good as the computer in your computer, but it's still a reasonably good computer. The advice I have is to do as much photographically as you can and then manipulate after the fact. Thank you for the great question. Um, I got a Go question ahead. from Ronald. Can okay. you just can you describe your method of conversion to black and white? 
we're going to have a fair amount of uh, content on that. And the and in particular, the second webinar in this series is called Converting to Black and White. So it's a it's a pretty complete look at the various methods that I use, but, but I will also have more of that later on in this presentation. There's no single method is the short answer. And uh, one last question for right now from Donald. Since Photoshop is such a vastly complex tool, what are your recommendations for constraining it to learning how best to apply it for black and white photos? Um, dare I say, buy my book. <laughs> uh, I mean, you really, I mean, you, you, you're, so, so, this, this was Donald who asked this question? Yes. Yeah, Donald, look, you're certainly right that Photoshop's a bear and a beast. There's just no doubt about it. There's more in Photoshop than any single human being can learn or know or use well. And sometimes I say that Phyllis and I combined create one complete Photoshop person because we tend to know different parts of it fairly well. Uh, you know, you also can kind of get stuck in a rut with tools, okay? Here's how I convert to black and white. Here's my recipe. So I, I'd say what you can do is start by following recipes and then as you get comfortable with the recipes, branch out from there. It's also the case that Photoshop has um, sort of what, what you could call primitives, things that are built up on, and if you know how to use them, you can figure out the rest. So I would say those are channels, layers, layer masking, and layer stacks, and um, also adjustments. And if you know how to use a curve adjustment and channels, layers, and layer masks, I'd say you, you don't need to know much more, okay? <laughs> thanks for the thanks for the very interesting question. The pre-visualization slide here is really about how Ansel Adams was really the first photographer to commonly use the term pre-visualization for what he did. He claimed that he went out there to wonderful places like Half Dome or, or New Mexico or wherever and knew what he was gonna come back with well enough so that he could process it in a particular way and put it through his system for making prints, his own system, and come up with what he had thought in the first place. And obviously he did that pretty well. But there has to be some, uh, concept where you go out there, you have an idea, you see it, you recognize it, there's a feedback loop, there also has to be planning involved, and then the creating and processing is lower down the triangle in the sense that you're never going to process as many images as you make, and you're never going to be sh able to show as many images as you process. Editing is an extraordinarily important part of my work and true for most professional photographers. You know, the, uh, the truth is that, uh, you're gonna be very surprised at this, I know, but not everything that I photograph is uh, gorgeous and marvelous. Oh, terrible, isn't it? But, so uh, the trick is to not show the things that aren't so great. The, there's, a, there's, a, there's a terrible paradox in this because when I photograph something, I have to love it. I have to be in infatuation with what I'm doing or I'm gonna say, why press that shutter again? What are you gonna do with that file, Harold? Put it into your archives? Well, you got plenty in your archives, you don't need more. So I have to think, hey, I'm doing something really cool here. This is gonna be a great image. I know what I'm gonna do with it, it's wonderful. And then I take it back, I look at it on my computer and I say, Harold, what were you thinking? I mean, really? So it takes me a while to get to the reality of what I've done. And that's something that you all should take to heart too. One of the great editing tools is time because after a while you can learn to look at your work objectively. It's also important to realize that only you know the story of how you made the image and what you were feeling when you took it. You want the image to create feelings in your users, but they weren't there with you, most likely, with some exceptions, another asterisk on that one. But so your own associations and feelings and emotions are 
uh, blended into your images, but that doesn't mean that your viewers have them. This is the paradox of the great boring family vacation, what used to be slides, and that is that people who are just bound up with these things and think they're the greatest things since sliced toast, they show them and they bore their audience to death. You don't want to bore your audience. You're looking at the uh, the government building, the Revolutionary Hall in Havana, Texas, with a uh, Havana, Cuba, excuse me, with a fisheye lens. The this is an image looking at a barn at sunset. What it's really about are the patterns of light and dark on the on the uh, planks on the barn floor. And this one is a pattern image that's a little hard to recognize. It's a smokestack and ladder on a on a launch on a boat. So part of what I look for in black and white images are clear patterns. And sometimes part of the point is that the viewer cannot tell what it actually is. Does it matter that you know what you're looking at here? I don't really think so. I like to photograph things around the house. And this is, so I actually made a point of including quite a few household photographs in this presentation because of, uh, well, because of sheltering in place. So this is a cook set in our pantry. Phyllis was like, Harold, what are you doing with that cook set? So I photographed it, put a slice of a Nautilus shell in it, and there you have it. Um, here's a, another kind of similar image looking down on some measuring spoons. If you're in doubt about what to photograph, in black and white, one, uh, one, one good tip is um, raid the silverware door, drawer. I heard someone on a previous presentation I did when this came up saying, well, everybody in their kitchen has a, has a hell drawer. Uh, if you have a hell drawer in your kitchen, and most of us do, it probably has things that will be fun to photograph in black and white. This is a old fashioned egg yolk se separator photographed uh, with a single light behind it to cast the shadow on a piece of white paper on a piece of burlap with a little sepia tint added overall to the whole thing. This is a uh, seed pod, a Gadesha seed pod. It's sort of a little like a big dandelion, again, photographed in the same way as the last image of the uh, egg yolk separator a pair of glasses on a sheet of paper, one light casting the shadow. Household objects. Here's a, um, an egg slicer and shadow. Shadows are extremely important to black and white photography. There's this kind of idea that if you're a photographer, you don't want to be out in the midday bright sun, you know, not uh, photo photograph either in uh, at blue hour, golden hour, sunrise, sunset, do it, use nice diffused light. With black and white, shadows are important and sometimes harsh light works best. Eggs, great white, the craters of the moon. Here's, an, here's a challenge for you. Find something white in your house and photograph it in black and white. I'm gonna do that myself later today. And uh, Phyllis's black and white cookie is not a bad place to start. Well, the kids love black and white cookies. This, by the way, is a black and white iPhone shot. Forks, not a bad thing to photograph. This, these are bowls photographed, another iPhone, black and white iPhone shot, photographed in Berkeley Bowl. This is a twist of paper. I just wound this paper up, made a pattern of it, put a light through it so that it had a shadow, and there you go. And uh, we've, we've seen this Nautilus shell here before. It's kind of echoes on a background, right? <laughs> it's funny. So uh, I was asked a while back by one of the photography magazines to write up a how do you do your black and white as a story. And they picked this image as the image they wanted to, to uh, describe. And so I had to go back to my archives and see how I made it. Oddly, it was photographed on white, not on black. It was photographed on a light box. That, that accounts for the glow uh, in the center there. And I converted it to, uh, to 
a black background you, by inverting the L channel in LAB. Turned out that was too complicated for the magazine and we had to go back and pick another image. But, and you know, they, they were right, right, of course, it's not relevant to most black and white or much black and white processing. But it's interesting because in some respects, this is not a technically perfect image. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to explain my own flaws and say why it isn't technically perfect, but it, trust me, it's not. At the same time, we've uh, licensed it many times. It's appeared in many places, uh, all kinds of prestigious uses and so on. There's a quality to it that, that is very interesting and it's not your standard Nautilus quality. Here's a more technically perfect Nautilus and uh, a different Nautilus view. And since we're sort of on the Nautilus Edward Weston theme, here is a pepper. Okay, so let's get a little bit more into the issues of how you convert to black and white. I hate to say this, or no, I don't hate to say it, but photography, digital photography is a craft that's one part technology and one part very artistic art. And really, this has kind of always been the case. From the very beginning, some of the first photographers were chemists and scientists, and part of photography has always been tinkering with things. Um, it, you know, there's nothing to stop you from taking photography very casually and saying, okay, I don't care about this, all this stuff. But if you want to do it at a level where you're going to be able to find what you've done, reproduce it, save it, and so on, you need a system that's something like a content management system, also called a CMS. This diagram's an overview of the CMS that we use for my images, which are approaching by now 100 terabytes in data. So there's a fair amount to think about there. The next slide is uh, is from the uh, the the uh, black and white handbook, and it's a fairly typical color to black and white workflow. The you can see that up at the top corner, iPhones are a separate workflow, um, and and there is a a section by the way in the uh, in the creative black and white book on black and white iPhone processing. The down below, there's a best practices on uh, how, you, how you convert to black and white, how you make a black and white image. And really the bottom line here is that you, you do multiple raw processing and HDR processing to the extent necessary to get a color image that is exaggerated so that the color can be picked up by the black and white processors. Then when you process to black and white, you use different processes for different parts of the image as much as you want. None of that may be necessary if you have what you want coming straight out of the camera, but often that's not the case. The bottom of this image is an effort to quality kind of arrow, and you can see that in this uh, diagram as well from another one of my books. You know, basically, the point here is that there are many ways to convert to black and white. You can hit a button in the camera and get uh, grayscale JPEGs with no effort at all, really, to something that is quite a bit of work. Now, I'm going to tell you that in the uh, wet dark room, Ansel Adams uh, worked spent a great deal of time and effort working. I've been privileged enough to visit his dark room uh, when he was working. And I've also recently had heard discussions from a number of his assistants uh, who are today very distinguished photographers. And it's very clear he spent a lot of time working in the dark room doing things that might be the analog to working in Photoshop today. So, you know, no pain, no gain, basically. It's a nice waterfall in Yosemite in the winter time. Another one looking up in Antelope Canyon. I like creating black and white images which have an infinity point in the image. What you can do if you reproduce something like this and are prepared to Photoshop it is put your uh, a name or signature or face or something down at the bottom of it where a train might be coming through this old train bridge. I put a picture of my face 
if you, if you ever get a print of this image and look at it with a fairly strong magnifying glass, you'll be able to see me looking back at you. Ha ha. Right now, in a different universe, in a very different universe, a universe that split off from ours, I am walking on the Camino de Santiago. Quite seriously, uh, this would be my second day on the on the trail. I've spent over the last over the last three years. I've spent some of each spring walking portions of the Camino in uh, Galicia, Spain. This is the part of the uh, Camino Portuguese, the bridge between Portugal and Spain. It was a frontier of over the river Minho. It was a frontier of war for hundreds of years, but if, since the uh, Eurozone came about today, you just walk across it. And here's another infinity point stretching out here. And this is the uh, side of the uh, Cathedral of uh, St. James, the famous cathedral in Santiago de Compostela with the shell that's the emblem of the pilgrimage. The shell as a symbol for pilgrimage and for this area actually predates the uh, Catholic and Christian pilgrimage. It was the symbol of a, a Greek and then Roman goddess, uh, Aphrodite and Athena. But it's all over the place, of course, when you're on the pilgrimage. And as you can see it, it's formally built into the side of the cathedral. And it's also uh, in Galicia on all the manhole covers for this iPhone shot converted to black and white. So I kind of use my iPhone, since iPhone came up earlier in this discussion, as sort of a sketch tool and also something where I want to make uh, images that may have a more humorous bent to them. One of the things that's a great deal of fun in black and white is to use a longish exposure, about 30 seconds, to still the violent action of waves and storms. This is an Atlantic storm off Monhegan Island, off the coast of Maine. And here's a comparable storm off Marin Headlands at about uh, 30 second exposure, stilling the action of the waves and making this great, soft, wonderful motion. If shadows are part of the key thing in the composition of black and white images, then contrast is very important. And the contrast between the mountains on the left and the shadows of the right are what makes this image, which uh, has been a surprisingly popular or surprising to me, since it's kind of a very cerebral image, uh, is a popular print. The Scale is something that is played with in this image because it's a vast mountainscape, maybe 500 feet between the ridges, but that's not so clear when you look at it from here. It's kind of a bird's eye view of things. Another high contrast image, this one of the of a place called the Wave in Coyote Buttes Wilderness uh, near the uh, Arizona-Utah border. This has been um, a recurringly popular image of mine and people look at it and they say, you photograph this in some really exotic place in the Orient. Well, actually it's not far from my home in San Francisco Bay. Uh, the thing that is somewhat exotic about the image is that it was shot in the middle of the night, about midnight by diffuse moonlight under the clouds. You can see that it's a night photo. There's a, there's a suggestion or hint of it if you look at the freighter on the background in the right, and you can see that it's night running lights are on. The, the real point here, again, is that a, a digital sensor doesn't really know whether it's day or light or night. It knows that it is light coming in, and if you boost the exposure to make up for the lower light at night, light at night can be extraordinarily interesting, as in the case of this diffused moonlight. And this is Cayucas Pier on the mid coast of California, another 30 second exposure with the late, late afternoon sea spray and fog coming in to create a nice compelling image like this. Phyllis, before I go on, are there any questions at this point? Oh yes, I've been uh, ganging them up here. Uh, Richard would like to know when making a single exposure, do you use the technique of exposing to the right? Um, well, 
Richard, it kind of depends. I mean, let me let me explain the idea behind exposing to the right. Um, the the idea is that there's more data there, so therefore you'll have more data to work with when you actually process your photo. What uh, the 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 problem is that your camera is not as smart as you are. So, and I, I know this comes as a shock, but we are all smarter than our cameras. <laughs> so your so what your camera is going to usually do for you when you hit an exposure is do what's called the uh, proper exposure or correct exposure is another term for it and it's usually going to be some kind of weighted average or but basically average of what's out there particularly in a black and white image you don't want that you want a uh, areas and um, we're coming up to a section in this uh, presentation where I show high key and low key images but basically what you want are exposures that uh, that that highlight certain areas of the image so look if I'm doing a 7 to 10 bracket exposure on manual exposure control it really doesn't matter whether I'm, I'm going to the right or not because some of the exposures will go to the right and some will go to the left if I and so generally that's that's my mode for quote you know serious photos if I'm kind of more casual about things and sometimes I, I am sometimes boys just want to have fun with their camera I would put it on aperture uh, priority metering mode and I pick an f-stop and I do I like to do that because it's easy and it's fun and sometimes limiting oneself that way makes for better photos. Now, I'm gonna look at the image and I'm gonna look at the histogram of the exposure after I've made it. And if I don't have the part of the image that I want in proper exposure range, I'm gonna use the exposure adjustment control to make it lighter or darker. Thanks for the question. And Ronnie would like to know, how did you know that you took the Nautilus photo on a light box? That's not in the EXIF data. Uh, Ronnie, uh, uh, certainly it's not in the EXIF data. I mean, I wish that EXIF data could get up in the morning and say, Harold, that was the day where you walked five, five uh, m miles before you took your first photo and you didn't have enough coffee. And uh, that was a, uh, uh, here's the specific botanic name for what you photographed and all. The good news is that A, I make some notes about what I do and B, I keep all the intermediate versions, what are called work in progress files. So generally, if you keep all your work in progress files, you can do a process of archeology span and find out what you did. Hopefully, you know, I'm pretty good at decoding my own mind. Other people's minds, not so much. And I, you know, I don't know what someone else going through my archive would think or not think, but I know how my own brain works. So when I go back and see something with, with that image, you know, I don't throw the stuff away. That's why I have close to 100 terabytes. I could see the raw files and I know what it was made from and I know the various steps in processing it. Thanks though, it's an interesting question. I wish that EXIF data told me more about my state of mind. You know, if the, it would be great if there were like EXIF data in there that were a cross between a psychoanalyst and a, an exposure data or something. Thanks. And Donald would like to know, he's curious about your technique for ensuring that the background is 100% black. Just go dark enough and it'll get black. I mean, that's a glib answer, but you know, and you, and you could do these things. There, there are measurement ways to do mo almost all of these things. But the fact is that if you keep going dark, dark, dark beyond what you think is possible, you can make sure you get your image dark. The technique in the Nautilus shell behind me is a different issue and that's called an LAB inversion where you take the L channel which is lightness and darkness and you use the fact that it's color opponent to flip it. I, you know, I, I, look, I have some degree of technical background uh, and I won't go into my qualifications and all that stuff, but I, I'm not scared by math and I'm not really scared by physics either. Sometimes physics scares me a little more, but um, biology at the moment definitely scares me, but that's another story. But my point really being is that I'm perfectly prepared to be scientific when I have to be. But the real idea here is to have enough technique and craft that once mastered so you don't have to be constantly thinking about it. It should serve you, but it's not the goal. 
okay? The craft and science and technique is the servant, not the master. I'm gonna go uh, go ahead a little, but I'll be I'll stop again in a, in a few for uh, I've got some sex some black and white images. This is one I, I made pretty recently a few months ago, uh, just before we started sheltering in place. And the point of these images is more or less to be high key or low key. So a high key image is a basically predominantly white and light image. A low key black and white image is predominantly dark or black. And usually there's some little um, haiku or piece of significance in the high key image, like this uh, train bridge that's open here, the Dunbarton train bridge. It's just a line across um, this image. So you could diagram it for simplicity and say, hey, this, this image looks like a piece of white with a line straight across it. Well, yeah. And this high key image of a flower and its uh, shadow is also very straightforward. It's, there's nothing, there, there's no mystery here. The point is really to present simplicity. And same thing here with this Proteus, my heart like a wheel. And this is actually a, an X-ray rather than a straight photograph here. Again, it's the lines of this flower, this, uh, Lily are presented as a simple kind of thing, almost like a line drawing. The Canterbury Bell, same thing here. This is an X-ray. So we're shifting from high key to low key. So the point with a low key image is that you have something that's predominantly dark uh, and there's a reason that it's so dark, a visual reason. This is the Bixby Bridge again. I showed an earlier photograph of it at night. This is with the setting sun from behind the bridge. And the point again is to make something you could diagram, the line of the bridge, the line of the horizon and the bright point of the sun. We have the moon rising between the towers of the Bay Bridge in San Francisco. And the theory here is that pre-visualization heads for photography, heads for post-production. So we really, you need all three steps to become the kind of photographer you want to be. Not so very long ago, oh, maybe six months ago, I was walking with a friend along a trail in the Bay Area in one of our local parks, and I saw these trees, and I said, oh, you know, from this angle, these really look like tree gods dancing. Let me make a photo of a group of them, and I know just what I'm going to do. I'm going to process them to sepia, make it look like an old time sepia image of a grove of dancing trees. And a number of years ago, I had an assignment that brought me to Yosemite National Park in all kinds of weather. This was a February with a great snow there. I was there early this February at a wonderful photography conference called Out of Yosemite. It was great, but the valley was completely snowless. It was hard to believe the same time of year could it be a blizzard and, and no snow at all. Anyhow, the the photographic point of this image is the contrast between the almost bonsai-like tree on the right with the great stone face of the elephant formation on the left. I do find myself under bridges a lot. The I almost like being under a bridge as much as over a bridge right here with the beams of great light that are cast down on the foggy coastal air. And here's a, the same kinds of beams of light on the Oregon coast near Cape Perpetua. Here's a image I would have made, I did make, using the aperture preferred technique with the camera wide open. So, uh, you know, a great deal of my images are really made with very deliberately with the camera on the tripod and um, a high exposure. I used a lens baby velvet on this one, wide open, to capture just the pistils of this flower. And here's another Nautilus version. This one's actually an x-ray. A sepia of a dahlia. A dandelion. 
and another x-ray. So, so we've been running through a bunch of high of low key images here, basically with a black background. This is a sunflower via x-ray. And this is a, a dandelion photographed for extreme in a, in a pretty extreme macrography mode with a black background, the, the sort of umbrella petals photo of the dandelion seed downward like that. And weeds on a black background. This is a hydrangea leaf photographed to bring out the lake-like uh, patterns on the lake, a river delta and a hydrangea. This photo is a, what's the difference between a plant and a weed? Well, it's in perception. This wonderful weed grew up out of the concrete a block or two from our house and I photographed it and the publisher selected it as the cover of the second edition of, uh, of Creative Black and White. Waterfalls are wonderful things to photograph. The great bristlecone pine in the Patriarch Grove in the White Mountains between California and Nevada. So this was one of my uh, early successful black and white images. And the point here really is of the contrast between the trees in the background and the aspen on uh, uh, Sonora Pass are really too high to capture in a single image. So it's a case study in how what you really want to do is combine the best parts of multiple images to create a single image. And I do like to photograph people as well. And in some ways, when you photograph somebody in black and white, you can get down to their basics. This guy had tattoos of his four kids on tattooed on him. And it really struck me as interesting, apart from anything else, because I have four kids, but I can't really imagine tattooing them. This is my daughter, Katie, who will be 12 tomorrow. And Phyllis in the upper right there. And, you know, when you photograph people, the eyes have it. If you look at my photographs of people, I'm always focused on the eye. This gentleman, um, is in his 90s and making his living still making farm implements in rural uh, Romania. And here's a gypsy, a, a, literally a gypsy in the uh, same part of the world. Very busy woman running a still among other things, an alcohol still. So this is a uh, process of in-camera multiple exposures to create a kind of fractalized portrait of this model. And here's a black and white image from the inside of Son Dong Cave in Vietnam, the world's largest cave with, uh, the, again, the moisture there was quite high, so you could cast a light and get shadows on the moisture. This image shows an in-camera multiple exposure technique with a model that I asked to do various uh, lotus-like positions. Phyllis, any, any questions at this point? Um, let's see, Ronnie says, the gypsy so sharp, but the mustache so blurry. Depth of field, focused on the eyes. Right, and Sabine from earlier said, wow, how did Harold get to see that Vatican art without other people in the way? Did he get special permission to use a tripod there? Uh, well, the answer would be no about the special permission. Which image are we talking about? Oh, it was early on the vaulted ceiling. Ah, uh, yeah. uh, okay, probably not the Vatican. Vatican is a hard nut to crack, I've tried. <laughs> Here are some more, uh, oh, I don't mean to cut you off. Were there any other questions? No, we're good for now some more in-camera multiple exposures. This isn't, you know, is it monochrome? Is it black and white? Well, the inner image here is certainly uh, black and white, but I processed it in particular to look like an old fashioned tintype, maybe one that hadn't been treated so well. And this to me, I, I don't know, you know, the model is uh, a remarkable, mar remarkable athlete really, but uh, it's sort of almost like a human being as vegetable. And here, my idea, again, is this is an old-fashioned kind of presentation of, a, of an image. There are elements of color in it. I'm photographing something that is like a, a, like a goddess, basically. So creative opportunities 
in, if you divide up the process of creating the kind of the deliberate black and white images that I do into really uh, four stages, th uh, you know, maybe three, maybe four. Stage one, you make the captures that go into the image, that's one. Stage two, you process them to black and white. That usually, or if not always, involves a pass through color as well. Stage three, you have your basic black and white image. Do you do something like this out of it, or do you process it in other ways? The uh, image shown up on this slide here is a, uh, is a simulated solarization, and that would be the creative opportunities. Stage four might be how do you print it, what do you do with it, what do you make of it? So I'm gonna go into stage three a little. What are some of the creative opportunities? Um, in terms of solarization, in the film darkroom, solarization was a technique where you selectively and somewhat uh, carefully exposed a print to light before it was fully fixed in place. The, uh, the artist Man Ray called his solarizations rayograms. There, if you look them up, he did some great ones. Anyhow, there are a number of pretty wonderful uh, uh, solarization simulations out there that you can use. And uh, in the third one of these webinars, I'm going to get into that in detail. So number one, get it right in the camera, if you can. Then first, uh, first stage, uh, tools in the camera, in camera motion, high key photography, multi exposures, many other possibilities there. High key, low key photography, um, so on and so forth. Uh, Post-processing, solarization, Blasfeld effect, all kinds of possibilities. Uh, here's a, uh, we're gonna have a series of iPhone black and white images here because they're certainly creative possibilities as well. This is looking out of a bus window in the rain in Rabat, Morocco. And you know, windows, we all have windows where we are. These are great things to photograph through. This is an iPhone of a succulent process with a border on the edge. If you take a quick look at this image, it looks like perhaps a Chinese uh, painting of mountains. The actual fact is that it's a beach. You can see the surf on the lower left, and if you look on the upper left, you can see something that might be thought of as bird tracks, but is actually human footprints, so that will give you a sense of the scale. And with this, uh, this is an in-camera uh, photograph of the moon rising up behind the Golden Gate Bridge, and so I just timed it so that the camera got it right. I'm really a great believer in getting it right in the camera if you can. You, you see here a photograph of a succulent that was growing uh, in a pot on our front porch. I tucked a black velvet cloth around it to get the black back background and next used an LAB inversion to uh, put it on a white background. I want to note that I fairly recently did an a series of LAB webinars, and two of them, and at least the first one has been posted up on YouTube at this point, so you can watch that if you want to learn more about this te technique. We'll be getting to post the second one pretty soon. Here's another example, model photographed on a black background wearing a certain amount of black. Here's an inversion. It's almost like when you had positive and negative film going from positive to negative is what you can do with LAB. And here's an in-camera multiple exposure. Here's a Nautilus shell added to the model who's in a spiral formation. Wonderful old tree, old California oak. And here's a row of trees in Tuscany processed, again, to look like an old, uh, an old it's, this one isn't a lithograph exactly. It's more like a, a old, uh, old printing process plate kind of thing. This old car, I gave a sepia tint to, to make it appropriately old fashioned, and a sepia tint on this uh, winter in Yosemite. 
With this image of the rooftops of Paris, I used a black and white special effect technique called split toning. The idea here is that you can have a different black and white effect on different subject matter areas of your image. So I used um, color selection to select the roofs and the facades of the buildings and processed each slightly differently. Sense of humor is really important to me in photography. You can see this in this low depth of field, sepia tinted um, uh, piece of the uh, circumflex key down there. To me, that looks like a little face. And I used the black and white version of this roof in Romania to bring out the sense of humor that the, uh, in this area in Transylvania where a lot of the buildings have eyes in the roof. So this is a face looking out at you. A little sepia picture on a mirror with a light box behind it, done to look like a Dutch pen and ink drawing and a fern on the same uh, technique. This is basically a, an architectural rendering of a the outside of a famous cathedral in Pavia, Italy. The inside is a Leonardo design dome. It's one of the bigger domes in the world. But what struck me is how cool all these interlocking shapes are, the way the pipes and the hose and the bricks and masonry all come together. And uh, well, you know, a Vincent motorcycle, who could ask for anything more to photograph in black and white HDR? What a wonderful engine to have to do. Here's a dragon in the Anza Borrega Desert. Uh, shows the purpose of doing monochromatic HDR in some ways, because normally where you have the sunrise coming up from beneath the uh, rough on the, on the dragon, you'd you'd have the side of the dragon facing the camera be totally black if you uh, if you did a single exposure, if you were halfway right for the sunrise. So part of the point of doing bracketed multiple exposures is to be able to get all these exposure values into one image. And we showed one kind of beast. Well, here's another kind of beast sitting up on Notre Dame. Uh, we've seen this image before. Here's the point of showing it. This is where the image started. This was the uh, raw file shown in Adobe Camera Raw, shown in fact in Adobe Camera Raw 6.3, which is a long time ago. Uh, okay, here's how I processed the image to color um, before converting it to black and white. So, if I were going to just present it as a color image, I probably wouldn't be so saturated. I'm over exaggerating my effect here so that one can uh, see it more. Here is the layer stack that I used to create this image. I'm gonna ask you, I mean, you can look at this as much as you want or as much as I leave it up on the screen, but I'm gonna ask you to take, the takeaway here is not so much the specifics. What did, what did I use here to convert what? That doesn't matter so much. What matters is that you can use this, you can use the presets in Lightroom, in Photoshop, in Nick Silver FX, in On One, in Topaz black and white effects, in whatever software you want to use, in, in Photoshop black and white adjustments. Um, all of these things are in here, by the way. You can use them in bits and pieces. I'm also going to point out that I have the color image as the background at the bottom of my layer stack. As a matter of good Photoshop hygiene, oh, that word hygiene comes up a lot lately. When I do my black and white conversions, I always leave a copy of the color version at the bottom of the layer stack and cover it 100% with some black and white, neutral-ish black and white conversion. That way, if I ever want to get back to what the color is, I will have that copy in there. Here's a photograph of the 
uh, flywheels that turned the San Francisco cable cars process to look like a 1930s industrial photograph, basically, with a fairly long exposure of the flywheels. You can photograph them from the balcony in the San Francisco Cable Car Museum, and if circumstances allow one to travel there, it's a great place to go with your camera, photography encouraged. This is in uh, Mission Dolores, San Francisco, one of the oldest of the great old Spanish uh, missions in the church there. And it's a photograph about patterns of shadow and light. And perhaps even more directly, this is, uh, this is patterns in the pews below there, a crumbling pier in Richmond, California. Tumbleweed, a tree-sized tumbleweed in one of the side canyons in Antelope Canyon. Very popular image of mine. And this one also very widely reproduced in many prints of it. It's a tree and reflection in, in the Isuin Gardens in Nara, Japan. The uh, uh, a monochromatic HDR image of some of the towers and turrets in Prague in the Czech Republic. This is the Altabruck in Heidelberg, going to old Heidelberg. And this is a broader view of the Pomphilentra, which I showed in a geometric image to start out this presentation. The trick in this fold of mirrors shown here, it's a photographic trick. How do I make the image without me in it very much? Because it wouldn't be very interesting if I were sitting there in my patterned uh, shirt with my camera at my face. So you have to hide yourself behind a pillar. I do, as I said, find myself under bridges, under piers. This is under the Berkeley Municipal Pier. To get to the spot, I had to be willing to share my space with scuttling crabs, rats, and various less than pleasant things. So part of my job as a photographer is to, uh, is to kind of have some joy in the less uh, polished parts of life too. This is on Point Reyes at the Marconi Grove, heading out a famous row of uh, Monterey Cypress. That's just a beautiful place to photograph progressions. And the ancient countryside in rural France with an old uh, Templar uh, church that's basically ruined. The uh, court in the Louvre Museum in Paris at night. Mountains in the key peninsula of Japan along the Kimono Koto pilgrimage trail. Dandelion. And I, I put these two images together here, the dandelion and the fisheye of a old fashioned barn ceiling because part of the point in black and white is shapes. These two images went together in my mind because they're both about circular shape. Admittedly, one's a macro, one's a distant view, one's architectural, one's a botanical, and they're taken with different lenses. But when you do make your own black and white images, keep the basic shape firmly in mind. Here's another circular image of a pop over, a poppy pod top and circular image in the Blossfeld style of Queen Anne's lace tops on a light box. And these are all Blossfeldian images with a sepia tint and a dark background. Here's a shelter in place image. I photographed this seed of just a few days ago. And the point here would be according to the camera light meter, I was to photograph it so that this is a single a single shot photograph so that the uh, little hairs on the petals were properly exposed and look light i had to radically underexpose by about 3 ev the image overall so you got to understand what part of an image you're interested in if if there's exposure variation and the whole thing Here's a monochromatic image of Matiea poppies on a, on a non-monochromatic background. And um, last year when teaching Great Gardens of Maine for Maine Media Workshop, one of the gardens we visited was a place called Schleppinghurst, I kid you not. And Ken, the gardener, owner, and uh, everything at Schleppinghurst built this himself from a quarry over about 
20 years. It's his life work. And the, part of the things in his garden is the incredible simplicity, like the shakes in this outbuilding that he built by hand. He said, you know, as time go has gone on, I've been a little more reconciled to using some machines in what I do. Spirals. There are only two known triple spiral stairs in the world, at least known to me. This one's in a convent in Santiago de Compostela. The other one's in a hotel in England. If anybody knows of any other triple spirals, please tell me about it. You have to understand that a triple spiral is going to be basically functionless. You don't need the third part of the spiral for anything except decoration. So that's why there aren't so many of them. So once you start talking spirals and monochrome, you can see I can get pretty busy. Um, here's one that I call down the rabbit hole because in many ways, this, the more you look at this, the more you see that the spiral stairs here are in fact leading down the rabbit hole. And I can go pretty wild with the spirals in many ways. And you can go create a scroll out of them. Of course, it doesn't just have to be spirals that you can do this kind of thing with. You can go back to the Nautilus and do it too. Um, I'm still hoping to go to uh, Paris in a year. <laughs> have hope, think about coming with me. Here's the table of contents of the Creative Black and White Second Edition. It's a little gonna be hard to read on your screen, but Roughly speaking, the webinars that we have intended, this essentially is the monochrome vision, the first part of the book, first and shortest part of the book. The next part of the book is how you convert. And so that's called black and white in the digital era. The next part after that is creative black and white opportunities. In part, that's recipes for what you can do with the book. In part, it's the theory. So for example, there's a section on swapping tonalities, a section on split toning, there's the Blossfeld effect. So in the third of the webinars in this series, I'll go into that kind of material in more detail. Okay, if you want to join us for the next webinar in this series, I sincerely hope you do. Um, and if you want to, my suggestion is read the pages of the book, 86 to 168, that cover black and white conversion. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to push this too hard or anything. But if you do want to get the digital copy of the book, there should be plenty of time before the next session, which I think is two weeks out. And you can get a 40% discount at checkout at uh, rockynook.com. Um, also, if you want to register for it, the URL's down there. I'm sure Phyllis will send out an email with this information too. And uh, thanks for it attending. I'd love to see some of your work. If you put it up on Instagram with the tags shown here, that way I'll be sure to see it's there. Uh, as I said, the next webinar, part two, black and white conversion is a couple of weeks out. Specifically, it's May 26th, Tuesday. I really think I got that right this time. And the registration link is uh, as indicated. And I will take questions at this point. Yes, we have questions. Uh, Susan would like to know, what do you use for the tintype edge detail? So the tintype edge detail is a, is a texture file from Florabella. There's a pack they have called tintypes and that's where it came from. And I'm doing textures and backgrounds, by the way, in the last, the fifth part of photographing flowers for transparency, which I think might be next week, I'm not sure. But, uh, and there's also a textures and backgrounds course I taught for LinkedIn Learning. You can find a link to it on my website. But the actual tintype uh, detailing comes from the tintypes pack that Florabella sells. And Dave would like to know, how do you process the images you take into the single HDR? Um, well, that's going to depend on the image, but I, you, uh, I use a combination of hand HDR and automated HDR. Primarily, I use hand HDR. What that means is combining images in Photoshop using layers and masking and either the gradient tool or the paintbrush tool. 
I recommend also putting images through automated HDR programs. Uh, I'm not so fussy as to which automated HDR program. It used to be that the HDR in Photoshop and Lightroom wasn't so great, but it's come a long way, baby. You can just use that if you don't want to buy another program. I use the Nick HDR FX Pro a fair amount. Also, Aurora is pretty up and coming in this field and does some pretty good HDR. You know, if you have a subject where, uh, which is just too complex to hand mask, then automated HDR can really come into its own, like complicated branches and leaves. It's really the real answer to this question though, and it's a great question, it's gonna depend on the image because images are like people. They're all different and that's where a lot of the joy comes from. Thanks for the question. And Richard would like to know, are most of your photos taken with a full frame DSLR? When I am not using my iPhone, most of my pictures are taken with a full frame DSLR. That wasn't always the case, of course. I mean, uh, you know, it's astounding that my iPhone now has more resolution than the first DSLR I had, but that's a true fact. I also got tired when I, since I do all this walking in my life, or I should say I did all this walking in my life, and, you know, I've walked all these pilgrimage trails, and I was expecting to be doing that right now again, uh, and that's what you can give for expectations, but that's a whole other topic. Since I do carry all the stuff on my back, anyhow, um, I, I was thinking, well, do I... You, you know, when you're going someplace far away, the main cost involved and the main, is the effort and expense of getting there. You know, what, is, what does camera equipment matter? So I always carry a second set of backup of everything, two of everything. I got really sick of carrying a second DSLR body and lenses. So I said, what are some alternatives here? And sometimes you find that consumer cameras can make a pretty good alternative. So I got a uh, Sony RX100 Mark VI, which is basically a consumer grade camera. And, um, but it does 20 some megapixel captures and it's not full frame. Now, I'm not sure that I'm really satisfied with that as a backup camera actually, but it sure as heck, it fits in your pocket. It's sure as heck and has a nice Zeiss zoom lens on it. Sure as heck is a uh, better than such a camera would have been 10 years ago. That's for sure. Thanks for the question. Um, Harold, I'm having a lot of requests to go back to the slide with the discount code for the book and also the uh, Instagram tags. There's this, the book. So it's H Davis 40 at checkout with the uh, Rocky Nook. And I'm sure you'll send that out as an email, right? Phyllis? Sure, I can add that to, to an email to everyone. Absolutely. And, and also the Instagram tags. There you go. And um, I have another question. Go ahead. Uh, Roy says, the exercise to imagine an out-of-this-world alien place and remove the thingness presented in the black and white book is a winner. Is there a blog article that elaborates on this liberating creative exercise? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that's a cool exercise. I think it's the story of my life. You see these alien things growing out of the top of my head. I mean, what planet am I on anyhow? You know, to, if you haven't seen my book, Achieving Your Potential as Photographer, some of that book is a little mundane, but a great deal of it basically is an elaboration of that idea. And Richard asks, as a big user of HDR, do you find it unusual or less than satisfactory to photograph without using HDR? Um, no, I don't find it unusual and I don't find it less than satisfactory. I mean, it's worth noting that this image, the road less traveled, one of my most famous images, uh, is not is a single, a single capture. Um, and, you know, the reason that was possible really is because of the uniformity of the light. It's all about the light. You know, premise one, you can't really photograph an actual object. Okay. What? What did you just say? Those alien things are growing out again. Yeah. Um, all you can photograph is light reflected or emitted by an object. You know, notoriously, it's a cliche. Photography is about... Uh, uh, 
capturing, you know, writing with light. It's about the light. So, you know, you look at the light and if you can get it with a single capture, uh, yeah, wow. More power to it. Why bother with all these stupid other exposures? Okay, I'll say two more things here. One, one of the virtues of bracketing is that you probably have the right exposure in there even if it's not what you thought was the right when you were right when you were making the image and even if uh, you know, so even if you don't use all the exposures what i've often found is i bracket a lot and then end up using one of the exposures that's just fine you know film is so expensive the other thing i'm going to say is that using a modern full frame digital camera in the raw files have a lot more effective dynamic range than they did a decade ago. This means that there, honestly, technically speaking, is less need for multiple capture HDR than there used to be. There's still some, but there's a lot less than there used to be. You know, you could say that the same logic leads one to thinking that there's less need for a tripod than there used to be, although I still mostly use tripods because you can shoot at higher ISO than used to be technically feasible and get away with it. So therefore you can handhold in situations where you used to have needed need a tripod. There are other reasons for using a tripod besides low light, of course. But that said, um, you know, there it's not about the technique, it's about the heart. Uh, more questions? Yep, one more. Uh, Peter has the question, is your next webinar appropriate for those of us who do not use Photoshop, he uses Capture One and Nick. Uh, hard, hard for me to answer that question. I mean, I, I think basically, oops, I'm going the wrong way. I think basically the answer is yes. I'll certainly be taking a look at Nick Silver FX. Um, uh, Capture One has, has a layering capability in it, as I understand. So while the, I mean, the key concept that I really have is that you want to convert in a layer stack. The reason you want to convert in a layer stack is because you'll want, uh, you know, some some of it in the uh, in in the Ansel Adams filter that somebody points out, and some of it in the uh, Nick structured whatever that somebody else does, and some of it in the Harold Davis Hootie Doody filter or whatever, and each part of your image may be different. So that's the reason. So that's a, a concept that's actually pretty radical. It's the digital uh, comparable to the Ansel Adams zone effect. And that's the key concept here. So I'm not going to be able to tell you how to use the capture, capture one and layering, but I think that generally conceptually you'll find it useful. <laughs> Bye everyone. <laughs>